Warning, the following video was rated M for If you're young, you shouldn't watch this, so viewer discretion is advised. But hey, I won't tell if you won't. <laughs> Digital Devil Saga 1 came out in 2004 and everyone was like... The game received mostly positive reviews from the handful of people who actually bothered to play it after not selling so on the motherland. The game ended up catching some traction in 2005 when it came out in the West, giving the hungry hardcore JRPG fans something hunky and mature they could sink their teeth into. Being a spin-off of Atlas's Shin Megami Tensei mainline series, Digital Devil Saga was meant to expand the new depressing ground established by 2003's SMT3 Nocturne. You know, the game you've heard is still crushingly difficult and looks like Persona, but you're not really sure why. But by using the foundation Nocturne punched into people, Digital Devil Saga aimed to create a much more cinematic and accessible SMT entry, while still being true to its gameplay roots. So it threw the paper-thin, atmosphere-driven plot out the window and got down and dirty with cutscenes and voice acting. Are you sad? What is sad? Now, the title was ambitious for Atlas at the time, so instead of trying to shove a 75-hour-long cinematic JRPG onto a single disc, the development team had the foresight to split the game in half, with Digital Devil Saga 2 coming out only a few months later. And while Digital Devil Saga 1 is really only the first part of the tale, it didn't stop it from being praised on its own merits as a worthy addition to the SMT series, so it's widely regarded as a cult classic. And it stayed that way because it's lived under Persona's massive shadow Girth Sense, you know, the other SMT spin-off, but not really anymore, I don't even know what it is. Uh, but it doesn't matter, cause nothing's escaping that two-ton tidal wave, let me tell ya. But if you're new to Digital Devil Saga 1, here's the basic rundown with tips, tricks, and heads up. For people who don't know sh about this game. So you play as the silent, serious Surf, the leader of the zesty, orange-wearing Embryons, one of the six militaristic-like tribes residing in a dark, damp, and dystopic place called the Junkyard. One day, while crying in mud, the Embryons go to investigate the sudden appearance of a giant squid egg in the Junkyard, but are attacked by their neighborhood frenemies, the Vanguards. While the tribe sissy-slap each other with bullets and reenact the Matrix, the squid egg gets bored and explodes. Yawn. Bored now. Branding everyone with tattoos and transforming them into demons. And this sudden phenomenon causes the embryons to black out, go psycho, and eat everyone on the battlefield. Eat em up, eat em up, eat em up, eat em up. After waking up from their food baby nap, the embryons discover a girl named Sarah in the squid egg, so they decide to take her back to their base before she pokes an eye out with those things. The gang then goes to visit the surviving traumatized vanguards to figure out why they got these stylish ball and tattoos, but they quickly discover they can control their demon powers as long as they devour others when hungry. So after coming to terms with their new diet and lost humanity, <coughs> Surf and the other tribe leaders are summoned to talk to the head honchos of the junkyard at the Karma Temple, where you get stared down for being fashionably late. When he looks at me, and I look at him, and he looks at me, and I look at him. The Karma Temple lads don't seem to know what the heck is going on either, but it doesn't matter though, because they are suddenly overwritten by a mysterious entity known as Angel, who says some truly terrifying things. All right, fam, uh, it's Angel here. So I went to Burger King the other day and I got a, I got one of their, um, their Big Mac equivalents and I thought it was really nice, but I thought, I thought the bacon was a little bit greasy, but I, I left feeling quite full. Regardless. So all in all, I think it was quite a good day. How's everybody? How's, how's it going, campers? <laughs> oh. <Aww. laughs> Oh, 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 hello, babies! Gotcha! This is a collab episode, y'all. If we're gonna talk about an older JRPG, we're gonna do it right. So I brought in someone who is obsessed with the genre. Mr. Clamps from YouTube.com slash Mr. Clamps. Like, favorite, and subscribe, please! Now shut up!
because he's gonna talk now. Hey there guys, the name's Clemps. You may remember me from season five of Home and Away. Look, see, there I am, happy as a clam. I have a burning passion for the JRPG genre and this passion has not dampened since I was a wee baby child playing Final Fantasy IX in my diapies. It's also ruined my life. I live in a box, I've lost my hair. Please send help, getting off topic. This game is definitely what I would consider a hidden gem within the franchise. So when I was approached by the butteriest of buns on her hands and knees begging me to assist in this mammoth task. Well, how could I refuse such a darling friend? I ho Silva! <gasps> okay, but back to the game. Angel tells the leaders that everyone has turned into demons, and the only way forward is to devour each of the tribe's leaders. The one who comes out victorious will ascend to Nirvana, but Nirvana will only open if the tribe has the black-haired girl. So, the gang, composed of Surf and his demonic form Surferoth, Agrilla, the Grill, Heat and his delightfully warm personality, <laughs> Gale, the human personification of binary code, Cielo, who's just happy to be here, and Sarah, who is actually- hey! We're not supposed to talk about Sarah. So the embryons strategize a way to take down the other tribe so they can ascend a space heaven or whatever, in hopes of finding the answers to their new demon powers, Sarah's origins, and why everyone's irises keep doing that thing. Oh, found them. <laughs> But along the way, you'll meet Apathy, my girlfriend. Scurrying boys. Destroying your foes with logic and reason. The 80s comeback. Rabies gone right. Excessive staring. Actual vor. Nocturne assets. Clamps. Clumps, those are mouth boobs. Mm, they sure are. Repeating textures. Being extra, extra, super duper sad. Grabby hands. Carnival cruise lines. Choose fun. Choose carnival. Cheekless pants. Ooh. Naughty. Geometry, the color gray, like a lot of it. JavaScript tutorials. <laughs> Killer starfish, overly detailed doors, sporadic emotions. It's a bird, it's a plane. E so there will be thrills, chills, and even tears. I actually found myself caught off guard by how much this story would impact me and reduce me to an actual baby at points. But on that note, emotion is a key theme and mystery within this title. It took me a couple of hours to understand exactly what was going on and why characters were suddenly going through big personality shifts, but when it clicked, I was always excited to see how this would later affect the rest of our cast. Now, one thing you should know is that while there are other Shimagami Tensei games that folks will beat you over the head with. Fear not. You do not need to know anything about the series in order to play Digital Devil Saga. It is an independent, easy to enter, streamlined JRPG with one brass knuckle on its pinky. But the world is a place wrapped and deep fried in mystery and seasoned to the brim with foreshadowing. So don't panic if not everything is spoon fed to you out the gate. It's got more layers than a supreme nacho dip platter and God, I gotta stop writing these when I'm hungry. But just know, yes, there are reasons for that, that, and that. But of course, Digital Devil Saga 1 is only the first half of the whole plot, and while the title is a satisfying experience on its own, if you want answers and real closure, then Digital Devil Saga 2, aka Digital Devil Saga Part 2, is where all those loose ends get tied up and thrown into the sun. Now, the game's plot isn't something which will send you off in every direction. It's a pretty straightforward straight line to the finish. However, you do have the option to throw some spice in the mix with the dialogue option that pop up every now and then. These options can affect later events in the story, but before you projectile spray feces down your leg like a scared puppy, they really aren't that frightening. If you want the best possible results, however, keep this in mind. Whoever coined the phrase, first for worst, is a big silly plum, because going for the first dialogue option will lead to overall better results. Just don't panic and go for the ones which scream, I am the goodest of boys. No pressure, ladies and gents. So JRPG is a term broader than my underwear, so what are you even supposed to do in this sad sci-fi trailer park? Well, the story will guide you along, telling you where to go and who to talk to as you shuffle jog your way from place to place, but the bulk of your journey will involve navigating labyrinth-like dungeons filled with puzzles, traps, and a bunch of people looking for a three-course meal. The chicken nice and juicy, we're gonna pass it through. Oh my god, this guy no, first. they're cannibals. Now, once you get to your destination, you'll get a few melodramatic cutscenes featuring socially inept fashion icons, you'll fight some demon suckers, and then you move on to the next objective, but with some chill downtime in between to snoop around. You see, in order to battle out the other tribes, the Embryon's bright idea is they go mobile by infiltrating various locations to take care of carnivorous business. So the game will politely lead you to the dungeon, tell you what your objective is, give you a little pat on the head for good luck, and then kicks you down a flight of stairs because that
that's when it stops holding hands. <laughs> You'll be seeing the Marabelle's ghost town, the Citadel's magical storage units, and the knockoff dismal land where you get harassed over the PA. Maybe if you had as much style as Joker, your game would be popular. But your goal with most new locations is to just get to where you need to go to continue the story. But the winding, twisting, ass-backwards mazes that fry your wig off are gonna make that a little difficult. And this ain't no case of randomly generated hallways. Nah, y'all, these are handcrafted dungeons with unique gimmicks that require attention to detail and trial and error to make it through. Think five-story Ikea, but worse. Which brings me to my favorite segment, Shin Megami Tensei, where the hell do I go? Endurance test. Now, let's hope you're a new gamer that can learn some old tricks, cause you'll come across stuff like the glare of death, toilet tunnels, this mess, and one-way doors that mock me. <laughs> but most of the time, the key to finding the right path is doing the wrong thing. <laughs> now start over! Alright, so I wish I could show you the labyrinth solutions, but I'm not taking away your chance to sit in the big think chair because every location gives you everything you need to figure things out, even if they're being coy about it. Failure will teach you what to avoid and what order to tackle things in, so it's okay to mess up and run around in a circle for a bit. It's all part of a process, the circle of strife, and through sheer will and determination, you'll conquer any challenge thrown at you so you can bask in the warmth of your giga-brained problem solving. You know, I don't mean to brag, but my IQ's 50. And that's a pretty big number. Now, navigating the dungeons only really requires you to walk around and interact with specific stuff, but even when you know how the gimmicks work, keeping track of everything can get overwhelming since the hallways can get awfully samey once you're in there. Uh, hello? Luckily, there are a couple of tools to ease the pain. The first being your map, which will show you every nook and cranny as long as you've been there before. And while it's always visible in the corner, it's better to expand it as much as possible to keep track of where to go and to see places you haven't been yet. So be prepared to take seven steps, check your map, three steps, check your map, turn 30 degrees, check your map, walk up, God damn it. So try not to get lost, but the map will indicate things you can interact with, like stairs, doors, and switches. But other than that, it's kind of vague. So if you're feeling medieval, actually drawing out paths or making pattern notes can be really effective when keeping track of safe routes. Now, what makes all of these labyrinths manageable so you don't feel like the walls are closing in are the terminals. I love you. So these things are scattered everywhere, but different terminals do different things. Larger terminals, marked by these lovely doors, allow you to save, bind new powers, teleport, and more importantly, restore your whole party's health and magic. Now, these smaller, dinkier red terminals that have been exposed to the elements can be used to save, buy powers, and teleport, but not healing. Nah, nah, only the little green ones can do that, and good luck finding them, because they are shy. But when you come across any type of terminal, try to use it then and there for something useful. Yeah, I guess that works. One thing you'll be needing to remember is that you can teleport between the large terminals, but the smaller ones are a one-way trip to the large terminals. You cannot teleport back to the smaller ones. This means you'll need to make sure you've stocked up on healing items and whatever else you want to throw at your poor unsuspecting enemies before you go on your trip. Now, what's nice after all of the needless loss of life, limbs, and childlike innocence as you nibble your way through enemy forces is the downtime between locations. During these segments, you can catch up with party members, go into previous dungeons to experience the grind, or sit back as the soundtrack lulls you into a perfect state of calm. There's no rush during these segments. The game gives you the freedom to do whatever you want to do, like going for a nice, relaxing walk through the junkyard. <sighs> like London at 2am. Now, on top of dealing with your Crash Course cartography class, you'll also be expected to use your demon powers to fight a plethora of other demons to show your demon dominance, demons, demons. Cause gameplay-wise, Digital Devil Saga has a turn-based combat system, so when you're walking around, you'll enter battles ran- all right, you'll enter battle. God, you'll. Oh, good God, randomly, you'll enter them randomly. It happens all the time. You can't stop, and it drives me. Ah, knock it off. Anyway, you're gonna be thrown into combat a lot when in dungeons, but all you gotta do is attack the enemies until they implode, gain some experience, and then keep on your merry way, serving you a delicious, nutritious gameplay loop. But the combat is where you'll be using your Giga Brain the most in an attempt to master the Press Turn System. A staple gameplay mechanic seen in various SMT titles, the Press Turn System. It hurts. Now, the game will give you the gist at the start, but y'all on my time right now, so here's my lowdown. You still 
got all the normal turn-based essentials, each action takes up a turn and you can spend hours stressing over your options, but demon powers have certainly spiced up the biological warfare. Because you can throw elements directly at your enemy's face. Such classics like Firaga, Thundaga, and Quake, <laughs> uh, what I meant was Agi, Zeo, and Terra. Yeah, that's right. If you've played a Shin Megami Tensei game, be it a spin-off or otherwise, you'll have a good idea of what these do. The single most important thing to take away from your magic is that a majority of your enemies will hate you for it. I'll beat your goddamn ass, you son of a bitch! The demons you fight throughout the game have a variety of weaknesses and resistances, and you'll need to have a sharp memory in order to make the most out of your battle experiences. Just be sure to pay attention. Because one bad move and casting a spell which the enemy resists will result in two things. Number one, you'll actively lose turns and the enemy will have an extra turn advantage. And secondly, you'll probably feel a little silly. We want to avoid this no matter the cost. That being said, if you hit the enemy with a spell they're weak to, then you'll only use half of your turn, allowing for an extra beat rush. This is how you win, y'all. Well, well, not really. This is lame in terms for beginners, obviously. The press turn system is a little more nuanced than just this, as you can see. So, links down below for how the other rules works, cause I'm not explaining all that. Now, a surefire way for making battles a much easier time for you is to keep an eye on the spells your enemies are casting. Are they throwing Argy at you ad nauseum? Invest in some fire resistance magic. Are they physically aggressive? You should probably take a look at getting a spell which resists physical damage. The thing which makes fights in this franchise so fun is that, sure, whilst you can take advantage of your enemy's weaknesses and make battles a breeze, so can your enemies. One mistake and you'll be eating a delicious combination of dirt and you're depleting pride. You see y'all, Digital Devil Saga is a little old school. The game expects you to pay close attention to the stats or else you're gonna get beamed out the gate. <laughs> Hello? I'm sorry, what? Game over means back to the start screen game over, so dying isn't recommended for your patience sake. One thing you gotta remember though, so you don't get obliterated into a smoothie, is to abuse the half turns whenever you can. Even if it means skipping over party members to get to someone with the right abilities, or stacking your party so hard with voids you create a black hole. Yeah! Now here's my fat tip of the day, wanna not drag your feet during bosses? Save like you have OCD, barge into the boss room with whatever you got, throw a bunch of crap at it and see what it does, take some mental notes, inevitably die, and then just readjust your party and abilities to everything the boss is weak to, walk back into the room, and BOOM! <laughs> Knowledge really is power. <laughs> Success. But you can't just wail on every enemy group you see with your biggest attacks. Nuh uh, not in this economy, suckers. If you run out of this stuff, you're cancelled, and the encounter rate will actively harass you. So just know you do not have to fight everything you come across, and it is a good idea to escape basic battles if things aren't going your way. Like at all. Oh, 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 shit. oh, oh my god, oh, abort, 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 abort. Go, go, we gotta get out of here! but the quickest indication you need to book it is if you start out a battle in human form. What exactly is human form? Well, it's exactly what it says on the packet. You have the option to transform back and forth from human to demon so long as you're in battle. The benefits to being in human form are, eh, not exactly what I call a long list. Your attacks are limited to guns, which some enemies are weak to, and you're invulnerable to virtually every single spell tree minus the sweet inevitability of death itself. The biggest issue with being in human form is your piss poor damage output. So it's highly recommended to stay in your demon form and go to goddamn town. However, when an enemy gets the jump on you, you're automatically forced into human mode and I'll be honest, whenever this happened to me, I'd incorporate the Joseph Joestar approach and run the f away. <laughs> Transforming into a demon wastes a single turn, and it's really not worth the trouble unless you're desperate for a good fight. Also, if I can direct you to this math looking thing in the corner, it's called solar noise, but don't worry about it. You can barely control it because it changes as you walk around, and the effects of the noise are so bizarre and vague you won't even notice it, so just block the thing out of your mind now. There, much better. Okay, now knowing the combat basics can get you pretty far, but you can only abuse the press turn system if you have the right abilities, and you get those by purchasing monsters at any terminal. So think of mantras as buying ability packs. You browse for the skills you want on the tree, purchase that mantra, level it up, and... Abilities unlocked. Your mantra can now kill. 
So once again, we learned the hard truths about growing up. Nothing in life is more powerful than capitalism because mantras can get awfully pricey and you'll want to try to unlock everything you can. So to get the best powers faster, just remember to get that coin, babe or start a modest savings account, I don't know. But in order to level up the mantra so it unlocks so you can use the powers in battle and beat the game, you need Atma points, which you gain by harmlessly devouring your enemies. <laughs> Oh jeez, is that really what they sound like? So in order to devour, it's actually quite simple. You just need to focus your attention on the devourer skill tree. Grab a few of these moves or have one as default and you can chow down on any poor unsuspecting demon as if it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. Your cue to start devouring is when they start freaking out or when their health points turn red. This is something we highly recommend doing in your playthrough, as devouring not only heals a nice percentage of your health, but it'll also increase the AP you get after a battle, making it so much easier to grind for that mantra you so desperately want to learn. Now, you'll have a lot of freedom to build your own party since everyone can learn every mantra, so go crazy, go stupid, play how you want. But here are some mandatory suggestions from myself with names I'm a butcher on purpose. Devourer, Ogre, I'm a Suki, War God, got that, that's easy. Basically any magic that starts with M-A or ends in N-E, Fallen Hero, Calm Spirit, Goddess, Sis, Goddess, uh, Angel, Thrones, okay. Cherubin, Sir Papium, Evil God, Spirit Karma, Illusion, and Insane God. So just buffs. Just like every type of buff and debuff you see, like like all of them. And every type of elemental void and or drain. But not repel because stuff like this can happen. So make sure someone on your party has at least one of those. Okay, cool, moving on. Now, the last trick up your sleeve are party combos. You know, the $5 ones at Taco Bell. These are special big moves that take up two turns while in combat. The combos are determined by what abilities each character currently has equipped. Like if Surf has blank and Gale has blank, then you can use blank Gun. Oh my god, Clems, we were supposed to fill this in. But you'll be switching abilities constantly, so just know that combos change a lot and tend to have some of the beefier powers hidden in there. So don't forget about them, because you probably will, but they can definitely come in handy. Now, of course, you're going to be leveling up in this game, and you'll start to notice something straight away. Your party members will get automatic stat increases, but you, the protagonist, the demonic Adonis, will get to allocate your stats manually. You put them into anything you like, but my suggestion suggestion would be to evenly spread them out between your vitality, agility, and either strength or magic. You can choose strength if you want. It's just a suggestion after all. But going with magic just makes those weakness chains so much more explosive. I mean, would you rather be Gandalf? <laughs> Or would you rather be this silly sausage who clearly didn't work out at the library? So as you level up and unlock more mantras, eventually you'll be swimming in abilities that you can switch around in the menu whenever. But each character can only have eight abilities equipped at once, meaning you better get used to this font because you're going to be in the menus a lot switching abilities around for the most effective party. And just pro tip, be stingy. You're going to be getting a bunch of crap abilities that you'll never use since mantras are a package deal only, so just don't use them. It's okay being boring sometimes. Can't go wrong with loading your party with the safest, most effective abilities you've got with some elemental variety. And speaking of party, your party. <laughs> Not really that complicated. You're limited to a party of three in combat, but you'll get access to more of your comrades throughout the game and you can switch them around in the menu and while fighting. And of course, mantras let you build each member how you want, so again, go crazy, go stupid, but try to use everyone equally since characters only level up if they are used in combat, unless you have very specific abilities equipped on all of your party members at all times, which most of you won't. So because each member have different resistances and weaknesses, it is best to keep them all being so you don't drag your shrimpy comrade into a force fight and watch him get bullied to death. Now, during your luxurious time in the junkyard, you can be struck with sudden status effects while in combat. Things like poison, stun, frisky, curse, and ugh, stomach aches, because if you devour too much, you can get constipated, apparently. But status effects are almost always never good, and if left untreated, they will, without fail, make things worse. 
Now, while there are certain abilities that can cure them in a single turn, that uses up precious MP and a space for something useful. So it's best to use items instead. Obviously, the best place to stock up on items is at shops, which can usually be found in places of rest or near to a large terminal. You're gonna want to remember to stock up on virtually everything that can heal you. Even if you look at the status effect and think, <laughs> the game thinks I'm the sort of person to panic. How have you know I fought in both world wars and I- <laughs> I'll have 10 panaceas, please and thank you. It's always better to go prepared. The Shin Megami Tensei series can be brutal with its status debuffs, and Digital Devil Saga is no different. Now, for the love of all that is holy, please keep this in mind on your first playthrough. The cells you pick up during the game are put there to fill your dirty little pockets full of cold, hard cash. Be sure to sell them whenever you have the chance until you have enough to buy your own pharmacy. So while the main game is a dense, linear adventure where you discover the true meaning of the Hunger Games, there is a handful of extra content that doubles the playtime if you're feeling hardcore. The first being everyone's favorite JRPG trope, extra bosses. These suckers range in difficulty and can normally be found hiding in completed dungeons. Not exactly a must-do since they can be a massive headache to access and they are really just there to wreck your sh but they're kinda cool looking and you gain experience and items for doing so, so links down below if you want to be that guy. Now for all of you out there who are craving even more of this game after you've beaten it, have no fear. Because there is a new game plus. Some of the features being, the mantra that you've stored away in your cheeks like a friendly rodent will still be ready to use in your new game file. The mantra that you purchased but haven't mastered will also be unlocked. Crack open the best champagne because you'll be able to stay in human form at all times with the optional passive ability. Huzzah! Your levels are reset and your items will be thrown into the magical trash can in the sky. And for all of you long-term SMT fans out there, there's an incredibly challenging, iconic secret boss you can fight, known as one of the most powerful demons in the series history. <laughs> Okay, so here are a bunch of tips and things you should know before you get started. Buy up the elemental magic mantra tree the character is weak to so you get the resist abilities faster, aka make this guy blast fire good. Critical attacks can give you a half turn, and if the enemy is status afflicted, it raises their critical hit chances. Okay, kinda lied. Solar noise does do something kinda useful. It can tell you your escape battle chances. Minimum noise means it's harder to escape, and maximum noise means you are likely to escape. Hope that blowed your mind. The brain boys here can be damaged by guns and they give a lot of goodies if they are killed, but they're kind of hard to kill because they are absolute cowards! Make sure to keep your health up by healing after every fight in the menu and try to save MP as much as possible. Multi-hit magic is great and all, but they ain't worth losing half turns over. Go for single hits if you're dealing with multiple enemy resistances. Please note that Cielo has no elemental weaknesses. He is just weak to status effects, so... Have fun! The auto button here just makes everyone do physical attacks back to back. It's good for low level grinding, but it's great for killing yourself if you need to reload. The reason I said get all the buffs is because they last the entire fight and they stack. Unless you get them slapped off, of course, which is soul crushing, but still, very much worth your time. If you want to buy Digital Devil Saga, then there are still quite a few options available to you. If you still own a PS3, you can buy digital copies on PSN, and physical PS2 copies are still dirt cheap. So while Digital Devil Saga 1 never really reached the fame levels of its more charismatic cousin, it did offer a challenging, mature, grim, but accessible experience for JRPG lovers at the time. With its gripping, mystery-driven storytelling, compelling characters, and a wonderful soundtrack and overall design, we'll hopefully hook you into the series as a whole. I obviously want to thank Buns for allowing this stinky rat to collab on this video. If you want to watch some more videos which relate to JRPGs or Japanese games in general with a light-hearted twist, then please go over onto my channel and subscribe whilst you're over there. And even if the game is stuck in the cult classic bubble forever, I hope this Basics Beginner's Guide makes your gaming experience a little better. So please rate, comment, and subscribe, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Yo, yo, you giddy yo, welcome to the end of the video. This is just the part where we have thank yous and we uh, shill a bunch of stuff. So obviously I want to give a big special thank you to the lovely Mr. Klemps for being a part of this video and sharing a passion for digital 
Little Devil Saga and just helping me tremendously with basically every aspect of this. So thank you so much, Clemps, and uh, guys, please go subscribe. Also, I want to give a big special thank you to Forever KT for not just cameoing in this video, but also basically writing a lot of the jokes and helping me with a ton of edits and Photoshop. So KT, thank you so, so, so very much. If you guys want to check out his content, links down below to his channel. But of course, none of this content is possible without the help of my amazing Patreons. Thank you guys so much for being patient, supporting the content, and just being lovely, kind people. So if you guys like to support me on Patreon, links down below. I offer a variety of perks. You can get early access to my videos, a bunch of behind the scenes content, access to my private Discord, and a bunch of other stuff. So if you're interested in that, please go ahead and check it out. But by no means, you know, don't worry. It's, it's all optional. Stuff still comes out. And this episode's Patreon shoutout goes to Cry, Nicholas Hartman, and Zero Guard. Thank you guys so much for your support, and don't forget to devour your enemies. If you guys would like to find me on other parts of the internet, please go ahead and check out my Twitter, my Twitch, my Instagram, and also my side channel, Super Extra Buns, where I upload a lot of my gameplay stuff. But uh, yeah, go find me somewhere. I'm there. But that's all I really got. So uh, yeah, we're ending. Get out of here. Bye bye Toodles. <laughs>